Our goal with this project and with others we've planned in 2017 is to encourage more young people, especially girls, to see science and technology as a natural choice as they continue their education and to play our part in making the UK the very best place in the world to do science and the world's leading knowledge economy. Which brings me to the fourth way we measure the impact of the BBC, and that is supporting the wider creative economy. But actually, not just as a cornerstone of the UK's creative industries, though one thing the Charter has highlighted again is just how important a strong BBC is at the heart of a media sector that punches way above its weight worldwide but also in helping to create jobs, skills, opportunities at local and regional level right around the country. And this doesn't happen by accident. At the start of this month, I visited the BBC teams in Cardiff, where our Rothlock Studios are a world-class powerhouse of drama production, the permanent home for such flagships as Casualty, Doctor Who, Pablo Cum. Only a few years ago, we were told that it was too much of a risk to open up a centre of excellence for drama in Cardiff, Yet today, BBC Wales' success in network production has been a catalyst for the remarkable transformation of the creative industries in South Wales, a sector capable of attracting big names like Pinewood, Hartswood, the makers of Sherlock, and Fiction Factory, makers of Hinterland. World-class innovators, digital entrepreneurs, all now located near us because we're there. And when the BBC uh, Wales relocates to a new building uh, opposite the station, near Cardiff Central Station, um, on the way to the Arms Park, we'll be helping to kick-start one of the biggest regeneration projects in Cardiff's recent history, spreading yet more benefits. In fact, it's estimated that our decision to move will unlock more than a billion pounds of economic value over the next 10 years. And it's something the BBC can do, and I think only the BBC can do, as a magnet for creative talent and a powerful catalyst for economic activity. I mean, you know, I know, it's an impact we've already had elsewhere around the country, acting as an anchor tenant to build creative media hubs in Glasgow with Pacific Key, Bristol with a natural history unit, and Salford, Manchester, with Media City UK. For example, our decision to relocate a major chunk of our operations to Salford in 2011 meant not only that other media organizations were attracted to join us, but also that within a few years, our activities in the North were worth more than 275 million pounds each year to the UK economy, not to mention jobs, skills, training for the region. And this is a real priority for me, the role of the BBC in training and in skills development. We're not just the biggest provider of media and creative skills training in the UK. We're the biggest in Europe. In fact, we're one of the biggest in the world. But it's not enough to train and employ the same kind of people we've always, always trained. The BBC needs to represent the whole country. It's here for everyone. When I was at the Royal Opera House, I made it my mission to open our doors to new and different talent from the widest range of backgrounds. And when I came back to the BBC, I wanted to do the same. Back then, the BBC had just 37 apprentices across the whole organization. And I set us a target of reaching 1% of our workforce within three years. And I'm proud to say we hit that two years early and we've now gone beyond it. And one of our best schemes for helping to achieve this was in local radio. Too often, there's a sense that these kind of appointments end up going to people with connections or only to people who can afford to get to London or live here or in the big cities. And the idea with this scheme was to give young people the opportunity to work for the BBC wherever they live. I met the first 46 local radio apprentices in their first week of training. I met them again when they were graduating a year later. And what an incredible transformation for them and for us and for local newsrooms around the country. One of them was a young woman called Aileen, an apprentice with the um, Gaelic language Radio Nangail, who kept telling me I had to come to Stornoway. And so a few weeks ago, I made it up there and saw her again. And she told me the good news, which she's now beaten off competition to get herself a full-time job in broadcasting because of her apprenticeship in her hometown. And when I spoke to her boss and asked how she'd done it, the answer was simple, talent. You'd spotted talent, and she's talent. But the impact of the BBC at local level is also the starting point for the fifth and final important role I want to highlight this morning, and that's the role we play for British identity. The impact that our unique status, uh, local, national, and global, allows us to have in bringing the country together, reflecting it to itself, and representing it to the world. 
A few weeks ago, I was in Hull to launch their programme of events as the UK's City of Culture for 2017. And out of all the fantastic announcements that day, and there were so, so many, from the city, from us, from other partners, there was one small promise from me, which I'm uh, slightly awkwardly, I have to say, got the biggest cheer. And that was when I said that we'd give Hull a permanent home on the BBC weather map from next year to celebrate <laughs> their status. <laughs> Twitter went wild, the story made headlines for, for days. They were talking about it on Radio Humpers and all that stuff. And it's not every day you get the chance, quite literally, to put a city on the map. But it's also, uh, it just reminded me, reminded all of us, I hope, of just how much the BBC and small things like that can really matter and have impact at a local level. At the start of the year, I was in Carlisle in the wake of the appalling floods there. So not only was I able to witness at first hand the incredible job our local news teams were doing in helping to keep people informed, and by the way, helping to keep local people informed when their houses, for about half of them I think, their houses also were being flooded. But, this is really important, they were there after everybody else had gone to carry on reporting the stories of people's lives and what they were facing. And I spoke to uh, some uh, local people who were telling me, actually very forcefully, that it's actually the BBC Radio Cumbria more than anything else that helps unite and define Cumbria as a region. And once again, it really brought home how important the BBC is to our sense of identity, but not just at a local and regional level, but globally too. For nearly 85 years, uh, the BBC World Service has been our voice to the world, one of the country's biggest sources of international influence, carrying our cultural and democratic values across the globe. It's a gift to the world, from the BBC, from you, on behalf of Britain. Nearly 70% of UK opinion formers say it does mean it does the most to serve our interests abroad, and it's ranked second by the public after the armed forces. The government recognised this again last year when I went to them with a proposal for more funding, and they decided to commit nearly £290 million to enhancing the World Service between now and 2020. This is the biggest expansion of World Service since the 1940s, allowing us to reach millions more people around the globe in places where it's needed most and in new ways. That means making the most trusted source of news and information worldwide available in 11 new languages, taking us to over 40 in all. And it means enhancing our existing services with more digital content and a greater range and depth than ever before. This will get us well on the way to our target of reaching half a billion people across the globe by our centenary year in 2022. But it's not just the World Service that carries uh, the country's cultural wealth and influence to the world. It's the world-class quality of our programmes huge international exports like Sherlock. In China, some of you may know, it's an absolute phenomenon. Around 100 million fans, 100 million fans, can't get enough of the adventures of the pair they've nicknamed, not Holmes and Watson, but Curly, Foo and Peanut. <laughs> Peanut, apparently, there may be a Mandarin speaker in the audience. Uh, Watson in Mandarin sounds like Peanut. Anyway, there we are. <laughs> Nearly two million people turned out to see our New Year's special on the day it opened in Chinese cinemas, and that was up against the latest Star Wars. David Cameron was even asked during his official visit to commission more episodes, which perhaps suggests a bit of a misunderstanding of the relationship between government and the BBC. <laughs> but it's the same elsewhere, with huge international successes like Doctor Who, The Night Manager, Wolf Hall, uh, War and Peace. And I'm not sure what the TV equivalent of selling coals to Newcastle is, but selling Tolstoy to Russia has to come very close. <laughs> and of course, it's much more than just about drama. Strictly is one of the most successful TV shows in the world, with a format sold to around 50 different territories. And while David Attenborough's landmark natural history series have been seen by more than half a billion people worldwide, I'm sure we're going to get even better than that uh, with his latest. And what we know is, and there's data for this. Where the BBC is strong, countries are more likely to trade with Britain. And that's one of the reasons why we're thinking really hard about the things that the BBC is most famous for around the world. And one of my goals in the years ahead is to strengthen and expand those areas, areas 
in which we really do lead the way globally. News, natural history, drama, but also education, science, the arts, and also audio or radio to you and me. In fact, one of the big challenges, and it's a challenge I've set the team, is just that, to enhance what we're offering uh, globally with radio or audio. In my view, the BBC makes the best radio in the world. It's one of our crown jewels, and we have an extraordinary wealth of audio riches at our disposal. But with the level of excellence we have, are we doing enough to push the fantastic drama, art, science, documentaries, comedy, entertainment we deliver onto a world stage as well as to the stage here too? With our world-class content, we could use our current output and richness of our archive to create a Netflix of the spoken word. There's a lot of work to go through here, not least rights, but that's the challenge to the teams uh, I've given uh, the radio teams. Because it's one of the things that I think will help the BBC carry the full weight of Britain's culture and values, knowledge and know-how to the world in the years ahead and say something really important about the Britain of today. I began by saying that the BBC's public service mission as is, is as important today as it's ever been. The truth is, you know as well as I, I think it's much more so. Firstly, because only the BBC can do all these things at the same time. There's no other British organisation, culturally, that has our breadth of ambition and impact, local, glo local, global, economic and social, traditional and digital. But secondly, because the stakes are now higher than they have ever been. We know that Britain's going to have a new relationship with Europe and with the world. More than ever, the country needs the, B the BBC's trusted, impartial journalism to help cut through the noise and discover what's really going on. It needs the BBC to help it to listen to and understand itself, but to reflect the views of the whole country and help redefine our identity. And it needs us to be the outward-looking face of our country, to help carry our cultural influence across the globe and be the voice of our values worldwide. Thank you.